I think we've got a heat wave today, don't we? It's going to be in the 40s. <laughs> well, we're continuing our series of sermons uh, through the book of Exodus. I guess we're on a journey ourselves uh, as we go through uh, this book. But last week we looked at uh, the Passover event that took place in uh, chapter 12. And we looked at the Israelites uh, finally getting the green light to leave Egypt and begin their journey. Uh, today, this message, uh, I've entitled the Red Sea because that's the main focus of this, of this next section uh, in the end of chapter 13 and the beginning of chapter 14. Uh, and we're going to look at six moments today, but uh, it's interesting that God used this body of water to save the people, and I see it uh, much like baptism. You know, that God used uh, the water as part of His plan to save the people, and he, and he uses that plan today in the New Testament through through the waters of baptism. But he also used the water uh, to destroy the Pharaoh and Pharaoh's army. Uh, so uh, that Red Sea came in really handy during, the, <laughs> during this part of the story. But uh, we're going to look at, at six uh, points uh, in, this, in this section today. And the first one uh, I've entitled God's Leading. Because once they got the green light or the go to, to leave Egypt, they needed some guidance along the way. And we'll pick that up in chapter 13 of Exodus, beginning with verse 17. It says, When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though it was shorter, though that was shorter. For God said, if they faced war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. See, God already knew they were <laughs> wishy-washy people. Uh, so God led the people around by the desert road toward the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of Egypt ready for battle. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him because Joseph had made the Israelites swear on an oath. He, he had said, God will surely come to your aid, and then you must carry my bones up with you from this place. After leaving Succoth, they camped at Etham on the edge of the desert. By day the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. So we see God not only leading the people out of Egypt, but guiding them down the right path and then using a cloud and fire uh, to make sure that they would uh, go in the right direction. And so... Um, it's interesting to me that God doesn't take the easiest or quickest or shortest route to lead them. He doesn't lead them that way, but he leads them on the right path so they wouldn't turn back and, and if they faced a battle of some sort. And I think that kind of plays into our lives today that we need to trust God and his path for our life. I know sometimes we want to take the path of least resistance or we want to take the easiest path or the quickest path to get where we need, but God's timing it is not ours, and so we need to trust God to follow the right path He has for us. Whether that's the path of healing, or that's a path of guidance, or strength, or encouragement, or hope, or whatever it is, we need to ask God for His guidance to lead us. Now, He's not going to put a pillar of fire or a pillar of cloud in front of you to lead you around, uh, but God doesn't work that way anymore. He works through His Holy Spirit that, he, that dwells inside of us, and so the Spirit is a guide in itself. And so we need to trust in that guidance that God gave us. It's like an a internal GPS, if you will. Uh, we, you know, we have the, that uh, uh, GPS inside of us that uh, helps guide us into the best route. Now, I don't know about you, but I use GPS quite a bit uh, when we're traveling. And uh, it's always interesting that most of the time your GPS wants to take you uh, what they say is the quickest route. And you're like, why am I driving through a cornfield and why am I going through the neighbor's you know, yard and it wouldn't be easy to get, go another way. But they try to take you, you're, you're like down an alley and you lock your doors because you're going through like gang territory or something. Uh, so you can't always trust that GPS, but you can trust the Lord to guide you uh, to safety uh, through His Spirit. And so we always need to trust in God's timing. But that's exactly what God did for them. Not only did He lead them on the right path that he chose, but he also guided them with the cloud uh, and uh, the fire. And the interesting thing about that too, I don't know if you caught it, is the cloud and fire by night were always in front of the people. And, and so uh, we need to not get ahead of God. You know, God, we need to follow God and let him lead us in front of him. 
You know, instead of trying to tell God which way we want to go, or instead of trying to, a lot of times we want to get ahead of God, you know, he's not moving fast enough for us, but, you know, we need to let him be up front and lead us and not get ahead of God. Now, the second part of this story I call hot pursuit. Uh, I don't know, uh, when I think of hot pursuit, I think of Roscoe P. Coltrane <laughs> and his good buddy Flash. Anybody remember Roscoe and Flash? What a great childhood. I've tried to slide across the hood of my car before. It didn't work out very good. Uh, but really, we're talking about a different kind of hot pursuit. But it's funny how words, when I, before I first saw hot pursuit, I was thinking, I'm Roscoe P. Coltrane. But anyway, uh, the pursuit we're talking about in this next section uh, is uh, beginning in chapter uh, 14, verse 1, is this, uh, obviously the Pharaoh uh, changing his mind and going after the Israelites. It says, uh, Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites to turn back and camp near Pi Hararoth between Migdal and the sea. Don't, don't think Jason's pronouncing these right, I don't know. They are to encamp by the sea directly opposed to Baal Zephon. Pharaoh will think, The Israelites are wandering around in the land of confusion, hemmed in by the desert. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them. But I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all of his army, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So the Israelites did this. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds about them and said, What have we done? We have let the Israelites go and have lost their services. So he had his chariot made ready and took his army with him. He took 600 of the best chariots along with all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, so that he pursued the Israelites who were marching out boldly. The Egyptians, all of Pharaoh's horses and chariots, the horsemen and troops, pursued the Israelites and overtook them as they camped by the sea near Pi Hararoth, opposite Baal Zephon. Zeph um, God's like, hey, if you can't pronounce it, I'm going to put it in there twice. Uh, so you can work on that. But anyway, uh, that is uh, in this next section, God gives the Israelites. Uh, a command where they need to go and where they need to camp. And so not only is he leading them, but he's putting them in a place where he wants to show his glory and show the Egyptians really that he is in charge and he's in control. Um, but he also was kind of tricking Pharaoh because he wanted Pharaoh to think they were trapped by the desert and they could surround them and overtake them. Uh, but obviously you would think there's the Red Sea and there's the desert. They, they don't have nowhere to go. Um, but we also see this story that like many times in the previous chapters, Pharaoh always uh, changes his mind. And he changed his mind in regret letting them go because he lost all that free labor and all their services to do things. So he decides to go pursue them along with his army. However, this is all part of God's plan. This is how it works. It may look like for us sometimes, it may look like we're surrounded or we're defeated or we're in trouble. But this is where we need to trust God's plan. You know, God sees ahead, God sees the big picture, and God knows exactly what he's doing even when we don't. So sometimes we, like the, the Israelites, may feel like we're, we're trapped in our situation or our problem, or we're surrounded uh, by Satan and all of that. But God, if we will trust in him and wait on him and, wait, and trust his plan and purpose for our lives and his timing, and again, that's a skill that we have to develop over time. I don't think anybody becomes a Christian uh, or, or goes to church and then all of a sudden they're a very uh, mature Christian. Uh, many times uh, we can be impatient and, and confused and not understand. But uh, hopefully with time and prayer and studying God's Word and getting to know God on a better level, we begin to trust in Him. That's one of the ways we build our faith is trusting in His timing, trusting in His will, trusting in His way. And it's not always the way we think it's going to go. I mean, I can certainly look back on my life and see where... Uh, I, first of all, I messed up God's plans for my life. I did things my way, not His way. But I also see now where we were going through uh, hard times and difficult times or problems. And now I can look back and see how God brought us through that. And how He taught us when I learned to rely on Him and trust in Him. I believe He'll do that in your life. So don't be too alarmed or too scared when you feel like you're surrounded because God has a plan. And the interesting part of the next plan is really to be still. I think that's a nice way of saying shut up and be quiet. <laughs> but that's exactly what Moses told the people in this next section of Scripture, beginning with verse 10, that they needed to be still and wait on the Lord. 
Verse 10, as Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, was it because of there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us out to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Talk about turning on you in a hurry. Uh, you know, as soon as the first sign of trouble comes, they're already complaining and want to go back and be slaves. That, that doesn't make any sense at all to me. They're like, why would you want to go back and live that way? But in their minds, they thought that would be better than just dying out here in the middle of nowhere. But again, it's because they weren't trusting in God and His plan. Moses answered the people, verse 13, Do not be afraid, but stand firm, and you will see the deliverance that the Lord will bring to you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. What do you need to do? You only need to be still. So, I know our tendency sometimes when we face things is to complain, to gripe, uh, blame someone else, blame God. God gets a lot of blame <laughs> for things that, that He didn't do. But a lot of times it's because we're not, not trusting in Him. In this situation, the Hebrews saw that Pharaoh and his army was approaching them, and they became terrified, and they immediately started to complain and gripe uh, that God had just brought them out here in the desert to die. They would have been better off to stay and be slaves. And this is not the last time they're going to say something like that. that they, every time something didn't go their way or they thought they were in trouble, they always wanted to go back to, to what they had, which wasn't good in the first place. And that's how we are sometimes. You know, we, we, we are in bad situations, but then when things are, are, are a little, um, uh, things are in, in a way where we, we're uncertain or we don't know what's going on, sometimes we want to go back to that. That's why, why, that's why I think sometimes a lot of people end up in bad relationships and they go back to their ex, exes that they date and they're like, hey, they're exes for a reason, but if we go back to that because that's all we know or that's comfortable for us and like that. And the relationship wasn't even good in the first place. And so uh, we have to be careful that we don't go back and continue to make poor decisions or blame God or blame others for the situation we're in. As Christians, I think whatever our situation is, whatever our circumstance is, uh, that even though we might have a little bit of anxiety, we might have a, a little bit of fear, that we still need to trust God. And Moses tells them, don't be afraid. Stand firm. You're going to see God bring you through this today. And not only that, you're never going to see these Egyptians again. But the Lord's going to fight for you, but you need to be still. And that's what I want to say to me and you this morning is, we need to let the Lord fight for us, but, but we've got to shut up and be quiet long enough to let him do his job. So encourage you, whenever you face something like that, to be still. Instead of griping or complaining or blaming someone, just be quiet and let the Lord fight for you. The next section, uh, I've entitled Move On, because that's exactly what the Hebrews are going to do. Beginning with uh, verse 15 of chapter 14, it says, then the Lord said to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff. But they want to stop and have a pity party. <laughs> Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. And I will gain glory through, through Pharaoh and all of his army through his chariots and his horsemen. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I gain glory through the Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. Then the angel of God, who had been traveling in front of Israel's army, withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved from in front and stood behind them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. Throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to the one side and light to the other side, so neither went near the other all night long. And so in this case... God tells Moses, why are you crying out to me? Move it. <laughs> uh, instead of sitting there and complaining and wallowing in your self-pity, you need to move on. And I need you to move on because I'm going to do something great here. Uh, I'm going to show you uh, what I'm about to do, and especially I'm going to use your enemies uh, to show them how that I am the Lord, and I'm going to bring glory to myself through that. And uh, that's the amazing thing to me about God even today. God will use our enemies. God will use our circumstances and situations if we don't intervene or we don't, don't uh, move in on His plan. We just need to keep moving in the direction that God is and trust Him to work in our lives. But this is what, what He tells them. You know, that, that I'm going to use the Egyptians and show them that I'm the Lord and I'm going to gain glory through the Pharaoh and his army and all his chariots and horsemen. 
And not only that, the, the angel of the Lord in the cloud moved from in front of the Israelites to the back and separated them from their enemy. And so neither one of them could see. One side was dark and one side was light, and they couldn't see them. But I can imagine uh, God telling Moses that I'm, I'm going to lead you through the Red Sea. And he'd be like, say what? You know what? I mean, they've never seen anything like that before. Can you imagine uh, God, uh, you know, coming and, and saying that He's going to lead them through the sea? Uh, and but that's exactly what happens. Uh, he takes them to the to the to the sea. Now, looking at the, the the Red Sea, they might have, and I get understand why they maybe felt trapped because not only do I have the desert on this side and the Red Sea on this side, but I can can see sometimes feeling that sense of peril or that sense of fear. But God had a plan and was going to use this sea to do great things and lead them across on dry ground, which again, I would put in a little thing that God always keeps His promise. God always does what He says He's going to do. We can rely and trust in His Word and His Scripture. It still applies to us today. If God says He's going to lead them to safety through dry land, that's exactly what He's going to do. It doesn't matter if He parts the sea or builds a bridge or makes them all walk on water, it doesn't matter, but he chose to separate the sea. And we pick up this in verse 21 of chapter 14. It says, And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove the sea back in a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground, with a wall of water on the right and a wall of water on the left. The Egyptians pursued them, and all of Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen followed them into the sea. I also find that uh, pretty, uh, pretty interesting because uh, I'm not sure. I guess they thought, well, the Israelites are going through there. I'm going to do it. Or they were probably so consumed with their task of getting the Israelites back that they didn't even think about that. But verse 24 says, During the last watch of the night, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire and the cloud at the Egyptian army and threw it into confusion. He jammed the wheels of their chariots so that they had difficulty driving. And the Egyptians said, let's get away from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. The thing I notice here is all of a sudden, the, Eg the Egyptians are acknowledging God. You know, this is the first time that they knew the Lord. This is big L, Lord. God is fighting for them against, the, you know, is fighting for the Israelites and against the Egyptians. So, um, sometimes we miss little tidbits like that when we're reading scripture, but you know this is the first time I noticed that, that they're acknowledging, hey, their, their God is, is for real. You know, He's fighting for them, and, and it's also uh, to note that they noticed that right before uh, their demise that's going to happen. But Moses stretched out his hand and staff on the sea, commanded the Lord to move the seas back, and He did that, and they were able to walk across. The wall on dry land with a wall of water on the left or right. Now, I know you've probably thought, thought this too. I'm like, I wonder when they're going through that wall if they saw fish and stuff on the side. Do you know what I mean? Trying to throw a fishing pole on the side there and get one. Maybe I don't know. But uh, that would have been interesting to see uh, if that had happened. But uh, I've just been uh, amazing to see a miracle like that. Uh, and it's still interesting that some of these miracles they saw through the plagues and uh, even this, that they still uh, turned away from God. And we can be like that too. No matter what God does in our life, if we become too worldly or enticed too much by sin or temptation, we start backing away from God or start doubting God, even though we've seen Him work in our lives before. So, um, you know, we could be real quick to rush to judgment and think, boy, well, these Israelites were just a bunch of jerks or they're just a bunch of faithless people. But, you know, yet, yeah, you know, again, it goes back to we're pointing out other people's sin and ignoring ours. You know, we can be just as bad, bad as them, so we need to keep that in mind. But God separated the water, and they began going through that, and then the Egyptians chased them into the sea. But God threw them into confusion because he didn't want them to catch up with them. And again, I say this, God always wants us to trust him. He's fighting for us. And he is going to do things to prevent us from being caught, prevent us from being overtaken if we would just continue to wait on him and trust in him. Which brings me to my final thought this morning as they're going through the Red Sea, and that is salvation. And that God saved them from the Egyptians. That this story has a happy ending and a good ending as far as the story of the Red Sea goes. And it finishes up chapter 14, beginning with verse 26. 
Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, so that the waters may flow back over the Egyptians and the chariots and the horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at daybreak the sea went back to its place. The Egyptians were fleeing towards it, and the Lord swept them into the sea. The water flowed back and covered the chariots and the horsemen, the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites into the sea. Not one of them survived. But the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on the right and a wall of, and, and on their left. That day the Lord saved Israel from the hands of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the shore. And when the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in him and in Moses, his servant. So if the Israelites were going to fear anybody, it should have been the Egyptians, it should have been God. And not that kind of fear, but a, a reverent fear, a fear of awe, because you know, God obviously kept his promises. God said he was going to get us out of here, and he did. God said he was going to save us from them, and he did. And so seeing the results of God's promises in action made them fear the Lord and put their trust in Him. And, and I think God provides opportunities for us to trust in Him as well. He gives us opportunities to serve Him and worship Him, uh, but He also gives us opportunities to, to teach us and discipline us and do different things, but, but we uh, have to learn to trust Him. And we can obviously do that through His Spirit, through His Word, and see Him work in our lives. And so He provided salvation that day for them when Moses had the sea uh, raise its hands again and the sea would flow back together and destroy the army of Pharaoh and Pharaoh and not one person was left. And not only that, afterwards they saw all the, the Egyptians lying dead, dead on the seashore. Uh, now, to keep this in mind, the Red Sea is not super big. You know, it's not like uh, the Great Lakes or, or something like that. Um, I did, when I, I got to go to Israel several years ago and I did not get to go to the Red Sea, but uh, I went to the, uh, uh, the other sea, <laughs> the Sea of Galilee, and um, from up top of uh, a mountain, they had an overlook where you could see the entire sea from one end to the other and across. Um, and the uh, Red Sea is a fourth the size uh, of, of uh, that sea, if you look, look on a map and, and see that. So I'm sure they were able to see what was going on on the other side, and they could see those bodies laying there. So that would give you a little bit of encouragement as well to know that they're dead and they're not going to keep coming after us. And uh, what the Israelites saw was the mighty hand of God, which that phrase is used a lot in this book. God wants the people to display His power and see His mighty hand. And we see God's mighty hand throughout the story of Exodus, but we also see God's mighty hand through all of the other books and stories. We see God's mighty hand in the lives uh, of those in the New Testament, the churches as well. So, and we can see God's mighty hand in our lives today. God's mighty hand is still active. Um, he may do things differently than He did in the Old Testament. He may do things different than He did uh, in the Gospels and the New Testament through the apostles. But God is still in the saving business. God not only saves us from our sins, that's why He sent Jesus to save us from our sins, but He also saves us from a lot of other things in our life that we might not even realize. And so we need to trust in that mighty hand of God. You know, the great thing about God's hand is God's hand is powerful. And God's hand can do mighty things. But at the same time, that hand's also loving and accepting. Um, and that's something to think about. As God is, can be all things to us and help us in a lot of ways. And God will save you as well. The world throws a lot at us. You might not have the Egyptian army chasing after you. But you might have struggles with sin in your life. You might have uh, troubles with relationships. You might have trouble with finances. You might have trouble with all kinds of things in your life. And you're trying to figure them out on your own. And you really just need to surrender those things to God. Uh, a lot of people come to church. A lot of people become Christians. A lot of people get baptized. But one of the keys to making all of that work is total surrender. A lot of people only want to partially surrender. Well, I'll give God this part of my life, but, but I don't want to give him this part of my life. Or I'm going to trust God with these things that I know he can take care of, but I'm going to go ahead and hold on to these. But being a Christian, and being a Christian that grows and matures, it has to be total surrender. You can't pick and choose what you give to God. You either give God all uh, or, or nothing. Just like the old hymn we sing, all to Jesus I surrender, all to him I freely give. It's not 
Uh, son to Jesus, I surrender. I'm only going to give him things I want. It's, it's not that. That's not what it is. We've got to give God all. And if we learn to surrender all to him, um, it's going to help us be more blessed and grow and mature in our faith. And so I think that's part of the problem with the Israelites and part of the problem with some of these other accounts you see in the Bible is people were not willing to trust God like they should. Um, you know, we see stories of Moses, uh, David, Jacob, uh, Abraham. I mean, all these stories in the Old Testament where people try to take things in their, their, their own hands. God told, uh, told Abraham he was going to make him a father, but when it didn't happen fast enough, what did he do? God, God is, uh, made, his wife's made certain Hagar pregnant. Um, you know, we see it through Jacob, we see it through, uh, through Isaac, we see it through David, and we see it, and, and, it, and these are great people in the Bible, but they still, um, at times, didn't trust God, or they tried to do it on their own wisdom. And I think those things in the Bible show us, number one, that nobody, I don't care how much we put people on a pedestal, they're still flawed. You know, Paul was a great apostle, but he still had flaws. Peter was a great apostle, but he still had flaws. You know, David, Solomon, all these people still have flaws. And we're still going to have flaws. And that's not an excuse to sin and mess up. It's really a, a way for us to even trust God even more. Like, I know I'm messed up. I know I'm screwed up. If, I, if we're relying on my own wisdom or smarts, I'm going to be in trouble. I can't save myself. None of us can save ourselves. Only God can save us through Jesus Christ. But also, we can't maintain our faith and grow our faith if we don't learn to fully rely on God and trust Him in those situations. But we're going to see in this story that, that sometimes the Israelites do that and sometimes they don't. But we're going to offer, uh, we're going to stop there and offer our, our time of invitation. And I'm going to have uh, the praise team come forward and uh, we're going to sing uh, a song of decision if anybody needs to respond to the invitation this morning. Uh, you can do that whether you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, or you've never uh, uh, you've uh, never uh, placed membership here at church, or maybe you've fallen away from your faith and you want to rededicate your life to God. Um, you can do that as well. But I want to encourage you through this story of the Red Sea to remember that God will always deliver you if you trust in Him, and He always has a plan even when we don't. So I encourage you uh, to, to be still and trust in the Lord and let Him lead you. All right, if you're able and willing to stand, uh, please stand with me as we sing our song of decision.